Steve, thanks for sitting down with me today. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Steve, I understand you're the director of Strawberry Breeding Program at the University of California, Davis, with a pretty extensive involvement in plant breeding. Previously, you were global director for vegetable breeding at Monsanto. You've been, the professor, been a professor at Oregon State University as well as the University of Georgia. So you've successfully made the transition from public to private and now back to public. So my first question for you is, how did you get involved in plant breeding? And then secondly, is this something you always knew that you wanted to be a part of? No, not really. I, I, well, I started out in horticulture. Uh, I had an interest in agriculture. My uh, mother's side of the family was uh, involved in farming in, in Vermont. And I, I, never, I never lived there, but I was around them. Uh, so when I went to, to the university to begin, uh, begin undergraduate studies, uh, I, I gravitated to plant science and horticulture. And it was really a summer job. I, I was looking after I graduated to move on, get a job, exploring what I was going to do next. And I met a, a USDA uh, ARS scientist who was involved in alfalfa breeding. And he said, I have a summer job. Are you interested? And within a couple weeks of working for him, he says, why aren't you pursuing a career in plant breeding, I think my, my response is probably, what's, what's plant breeding, <laughs> right? So from there, uh, he got me really interested in, in the field. I, I began meeting a, a lot of the people in the field, people uh, like the, the colleagues I have here at this meeting this week. I suspect that you find yourself in that very similar spot now of, of having students right. that you can, you can have an impact on them. Is there an example that stands out in your mind of that scenario where you're, where you're, where you're with a student and you, your kind of conversation had an impact on their, on their decisions? Yeah, I, I, there, well, there have been many over the years. I hope I've, I talk some of them out of medical school and into plant genetics, but that's often the conversation. You know, why would I go into plant breeding when I can be a doctor? Or, but we had, over the years, we had many undergraduates come to the lab and some of them pursued careers, ended up as uh, uh, staff research associates in laboratories, went on to get advanced degrees. So I think it's, it's one of the most satisfying, rewarding aspects of, of, of what we do. Right. As I mentioned, you've successfully gone from public to private to right. public. Can you share a little bit, maybe from, from that unique perspective, um, what, what could public plant breeders learn from private and vice versa? Right. Well, I, th I think on the, the, the private side, there's, there's often uh, a really a higher level of sophistication that's possible. There's broader teams of people involved in, in, in the plant breeding uh, enterprise. When you're in a university situation, uh, you often wear many different hats. And that's not, uh, not as true in, in, in some of the bigger industry uh, type positions. But I think what, what academics can learn from the uh, private sector is very difficult to replicate, though, in the public sector. Just the scale and the, you know, sort of the technical scale and the automation, um, those types of activities are hard to replicate in the university. We, we, we do our best. Right. And then what about the other way around? What, what does private learn from uh, public? What? Well, I, 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 most of them start there. And so I, I think the main thing is uh, really the, the education process itself. Um, that's what they take away from their, from their experience on the, on the public side when they end up in industry. You lose that connection fairly, fairly quickly when you're in a, in a business. Um, but you always have your mentors and, and the, the educational process that, that you're connected to. Yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess the, the issue is you, the, the, it's difficult to create the kind of education you can also get once you leave the educational system. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the lifelong learning that is what you take with you from the education side. And it's an, it's an entirely new educational experience once you enter industry. Well said, well said. 
So now you're at UC Davis, a major contributor to the strawberry industry, and you need to clarify for me, as I understand it, um, 60% of the strawberries that are consumed worldwide are derived from varieties from the university. Does that sound right to you? Well, I, I, have, I have rough estimates in my head. I, uh, that, sounds, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Um, the, the, you, the, my predecessors uh, produced just an enormous pipeline of, of successful cultivars. And so the universities had, I think, an impact not only in the state of California, but, but globally. Right. Um, many of these cultivars are licensed around the world. They're used in other breeding programs. So yeah, I, I can't take any credit for that. I'm really this, the steward of the program now to carry it forward. Nothing like having yeah. big shoes to fill. Yeah, that's yeah. that that's that's exactly what it's like. And you know, there's been such a rich history and legacy of the program that uh, that's that was one of the key things the university wanted to ensure going forward here. So next question, kind of two stages. When it comes to strawberries, what are farmers looking for, and what are consumers looking for? Well, historically, the farm the, the farmers. I'll, I'll speak about farmers in California. Sure. Uh, the, the, you know, they're. They, they need uh, a high yielding product and I think that's been the, w one of the real strengths of the, of the UC breeding program and the, the pipeline of products that have come out of the UC program. Very high yielding, the, the, the yield leaders. Uh, so the growers are looking for that. Their, their production systems are changing dramatically. Uh, methyl bromide fumigation was banned in 2005. It's been slowly uh, stopped in, in strawberry production. So uh, soil-borne diseases are becoming a, a greater problem. And, and so I think the growers are really looking for disease resistance and high yield. Those are sort of the, the things that are on their radar. As far as consumer, yeah. uh, well, I hear flavor all the time. Uh, and you know, I had a slide in my, in my talk today. For the growers, it's yield first, flavor second. And, and a part of the issue is they have to have a product that, that ships across country and really is presentable on the, on the supermarket shelf. It's not that, that, that there's not an interest in having a, a, a more flavorful product, but you know, it's difficult to put everything together. There's actually a really broad spectrum of high quality fruit uh, cultivars, varieties, that, that also, but also don't have the shipping and storage ca characteristics. So um, it's not that that has been lost in strawberry, it's just not what creates that almost year round market right. product, right? right? Yeah, so they're just kind of different ends of the spectrum. Right, and your job is to marry them together. Well, we, we, would, we would love to have uh, the same yield and disease resistance and, and greater flavor. But I mean, that, that's been one of the uh, most uh, talked about subjects is how are we gonna get those things? But, but uh, really for us, we're, we, that, that's down the, the ladder of priorities. You know, I think the yield and disease resistance comes first. I saw that one of the, your current projects is uh, genomic enabled breeding for strawberries. Right, right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right, we, uh, we have collaborations with uh, several, several people, Pat Edgar at Michigan State and uh, uh, colleagues in, at Oregon State, Chad Finn and, and Vance Whitaker, University of Florida, really around developing tools for mark assisted selection in strawberry. Uh, and, and so that includes building a reference genome sequence and other genomic resources. So we're highly committed to that and that, that work is meant to really provide uh, public and private breeding programs with tools for uh, uh, accelerating um, genetic gain, building disease resistance faster, that sort of thing. Students have been a big part of your life for uh, yes, a long time that's right. now. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. I'm okay. going to ask you for three pieces of advice that you would offer to these students as they're making their next step into their determining their career paths. Right. Well, th those that know they want to be, want to go down the uh, industry route or the private sector route, I would encourage them to find some opportunity before they pursue their graduate work. So they, you know, whether it's a, 
an internship or, or a, uh, you know, a, a technical role in a company so they can get an uh, idea of, of the inner workings, make sure it's really right for them. That's a difficult thing often to know, right, when you're in, involved in your studies. That's one, it, so in, in particular, if you're interested in that private sector, try to get some experience or exposure uh, before you go down that route. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the thing I've always encouraged students, it, it's always valuable to uh, do your different degrees and postdocs in different laboratories so that you have different species, different mentors, uh, different university cultures. Uh, that, that I find that really valuable and many students do that but, but some tend to stay more comfortable and stay in one place. I think the diversity of experience is, is hugely valuable. Um, as far as the third thing, uh, lifelong learning. Right, uh, the, the, the PhD, a lot of times uh, a student is very focused on their PhD. Uh, it's difficult to take the broader look. Uh, this is just a stepping stone. It's really about you know, becoming a lifelong learner and not getting so hung up on just the requirements of what you need to do to fulfill your degree uh, in this phase of your life. But, so yeah. any, any last thoughts on if they're deciding public or private? You mm. played on both sides of the fence. But wh yeah. where, would, where would the advocacy to start be? And, and, or maybe that's right. not even a fair question. Maybe my question is, what factors do you think play best to people going down the two different paths? Right. The, uh, I, I've, I personally spent more time on the academic side than an in industry side. I have former students and postdocs who've gone to the industry and told me this was like the, the perfect fit for me. I'm, I couldn't be happier. Um, every person needs to, to really find that out for themselves. Uh, uh, the, the academic side has some challenges, often, often fundraising. Uh, and, and so as student, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend one against the other ever. It's a, it's a personal, personal decision. Some, some students today, I think, are put in a really untenable situation with some of these uh, opportunities uh, with limited resources and then you know have the expectation of raising uh, extramural dollars teaching mentoring it's it's a pretty tall task it's a great life though if, if you're making it work and, and you have uh, the the resource and the collaboration it, it's a fantastic life if you if you like that sort of thing uh, but you've got to be willing to publish and uh, write grants and do all those things, they, they come with it. So industry provides you a relief from that, but, but maybe just a, a, a bit different uh, sort of, of self-direction that you lose. Right. Yeah. Right. Well said. Yeah. Dr. Knapp, thanks very much for sitting down with me today. I appreciate it a lot. Likewise. Thank you for inviting me.